Hello, I'm Professor Mark Cunningham and I'm the Ellen Mason Bates Professor of Neurophysiology of Epilepsy at Trinity College Dublin. I'd like to tell you about our study which has been published in Brain by authors Chan et al, in which we describe for the first time a novel model of mitochondrial epilepsy and provide a mechanistic understanding of how this pathological activity is generated. Mitochondria are found in all cells of our body and are considered as the batteries of those cells, providing energy for the various cellular processes which those cells need to carry out. Not surprisingly then, mitochondria are very important in organs in which there is a high energy demand, such as the brain. Previous work from our laboratory has demonstrated that a particular type of organized electrical activity known as the gamma frequency oscillation is highly sensitive to compounds which interfere with mitochondrial function. Mitochondrial function is also disrupted in mitochondrial disease. Mitochondrial disease is a group of inherited chronic conditions which frequently manifest with neurological symptoms. And these symptoms include learning and cognitive difficulties, muscle weakness, vision and hearing loss, lack of coordination and seizures. And with a prevalence of one in 4,000, mitochondrial disease is one of the most common inherited neurological disorders. A quarter of patients with mitochondrial disease suffer from epilepsy. And this epilepsy is frequently resistant to treatment with anti-epileptic drugs and also associated with a poor prognosis. And despite these epileptic phenotypes being well characterized in patients, an understanding of mitochondrial epilepsy from a preclinical point of view has been limited due to an absence of good preclinical animal models. In order to address this, Dr. Lacks used histopathological and immunohistochemical approaches in human brain tissue samples obtained from patients with mitochondrial disease to demonstrate reactive astrogliosis and a reduction in complex 1 and complex 4 subunits in patients with mitochondrial disease and epilepsy. A previous study from Dr. Lacks had shown a profound loss of inhibitory interneurons in this patient cohort and that in the remaining interneurons there was a decreased expression of mitochondrial complex 1 and 4 subunits. As previously mentioned, electrophysiological studies had demonstrated that the pharmacological inhibition of complex 1 and 4 subunits was able to reduce neuronal oscillatory activity in the gamma frequency range and associated interneuronal firing, but did not produce overt epileptiform activity. In light of these new findings, Dr. Chan hypothesized that the functional inhibition of astrocytes alongside the inhibition of neuronal mitochondrial activity may be crucial in the pathogenic process of generating mitochondrial epilepsy. And using the in vitro rodent brain slice model, Dr. Chan demonstrated that this pharmacological double hit could indeed induce epileptiform activity. The model was also shown to work in human brain slices. Using immunocytochemistry, Dr. Chan also demonstrated that slices which had been exposed to the double hit had a reduced density of GABAergic cells and exhibited astrogliosis, findings which matched observations made in human postmortem material. Evaluating the clinical relevance of animal models is critical for epilepsy research, and as mentioned earlier, mitochondrial epilepsy is frequently refractory. Dr. Chan assessed if the model recapitulated this feature in vitro using a number of anti-epileptic drugs that are commonly used in this condition. Using minimal inhibitory concentration and maximal tolerable concentration, Dr. Chan found that there was no response of any of the drugs at minimal inhibitory concentration, but using maximum tolerable concentration, the barbiturate sodium pentobarbital had a significant effect. Given pentobarbital's effect, it was surprising that the benzodiazepines were unable to reduce the epileptiform activity. The addition of GABA alone was able to suppress epileptic activity, and the co-application of a low concentration benzodiazepine in the presence of GABA was now able to produce an inhibitory response, suggesting that the previous lack of response may be attributable to a deficiency of GABA in the epileptic tissue. We next explored how this deficiency in GABA arises in collaboration with Professor Helawaga Peterson. The GABA glutamate glutamine cycle is a vital process for the recycling of both glutamate and GABA and using high performance liquid chromatography we measured glutamate and glutamine in the epileptic and non-epileptic slices and revealed significant reductions of glutamine in the epileptic samples. This finding corresponded with functional data which showed a suppression of epileptic activity with glutamine application. We used isotropic labeling studies to dissect the glutamate-glutamine cycle and showed that there was a reduction 
in the GABA glutamate glutamine astrocytic component. Dr. Lax confirmed that this was the case by returning to the human neuropathological samples to quantify glutamine synthesis expression in the astrocytes in the patient cohort, therefore proving a downregulation of astrocytic GABA glutamate glutamine cycle. So in summary, we can propose the following mechanism with regard to mitochondrial epilepsy. The mitochondrial dysfunction in the neuronal compartment leads to a downregulation of inhibitory tone. And alongside this, in the astrocytic compartment, we have a failure of the glutamate, glutamine cycle, which leads to a loss of glutamine and a complete shutdown of astrocytic metabolism, which leads to reduced recycling of GABA, and together with a loss of inhibition in the neuronal compartment, this leads to a state of hyperexcitability and ultimately to seizure generation.